Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to CSPR book webinar. We are very pleased today to do another book, at this time by my dear colleague, Michael Ong, Political Censorship in British Hong Kong. Before I turn the floor to uh, Michael and, uh, and the discussion, allow me to briefly describe and summarize what this book is about for those of you who might not have the opportunity to uh, read it beforehand. Michael Ong's book challenges the widely accepted narrative that freedom of expression is a legacy of the British rule of law in Hong Kong. In his painstaking research, Michael seeks to show that political censorship is a dominant hallmark of most of Britain's close to centennial rule in Hong Kong, and Hong Kong only witnessed significant liberalization in the final decade of colonial rule. As Britain prepares the city, for his return to China and against the backdrop of the Tiananmen Square crackdown. With that, allow me to introduce uh, Michael Ong. Uh, he is an associate professor at the Faculty of Law. Even though his originally trained, tra original training was in numbers, he became a, lumin a, a luminous uh, legal historian and he's perfectly comfortable crunching numbers or you know, digging in the archives. And this book today, is the you know the epitome of his uh, painstaking research, and discussing his book today is no stranger to the faculty. Probably everybody in the uh, in the webinar today knows him. He is the uh, longest-serving dean of the Hong Kong Law Faculty, former chair of public law, Professor Johannes Chen. On that note, can I first turn to Michael and allow Michael to uh, to present his views to us? Michael, please. Thanks very much, Pujan. And ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining me uh, in this book talk. And I have to express my special thanks to Johannes for joining us for discussions uh, uh, this afternoon. So uh, today I'm going to uh, share my uh, uh, new book uh, or a snapshot of my new book to you. I'm sharing my screen. Uh, can you see it okay? I can see it. Yes. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Uh, thanks for the very kind introductions, uh, Pujan. Um, um, this book uh, uh, has just been published this summer by Cambridge University Press, Political Censorship in British Hong Kong, Freedom of Expression and the Law, 1842 to 1997. As you know, that's the period uh, under which Hong Kong was under British colonial rule. In this book, I basically ask one question. Where did Hong Kong's freedom of speech come from? So I think this question is very important because uh, there's a prevailing misconceptions or even myth, uh, not only among the general public, but sometimes among legal professionals, sometimes historians and political scientists as well, that uh, the misperception is that uh, it came from the very well-praised English rule of law principles, or it came from the, 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 the common law values that are supposed to embrace free speech, uh, uh, free press, Etc. Or sometimes uh, certain members of the public believe that it came from just as some political scientists said, colonial benevolence. Hence, that might explain uh, uh, quite quite often in the previous protest, uh, uh, colonial flags being seen quite often being waved in the street. This book disagrees with that. This book tries to challenge that myth and rebut that uh, conventional uh, uh, misconceptions and argues that, um, uh, in fact, what defined and confined Hong Kong people's right to speak in Hong Kong's history was not so much about how dearly common law values uh, were held. It's basically the outcome of geopolitical contests between China and the world powers including but not limited to, of course, Britain, the US, Japan, as well as the outcome of the changing world powers China strategies over time during the entire colonial period of Hong Kong. So uh, indeed, you know, as this book will show, uh, if you get a copy and read it, it will show that uh, actually Hong Kong, especially in its media and education sectors, were pervasively censored, monitored, and sometimes prosecuted if needed during at least 130 years of its colonial period until the last 20 years before it was handed over back to China. 
So uh, this book has, uh, 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 I believe, two distinct features. Number one is completely uh, archives based. It's based on the archival sources that are found from the National Archives in the UK, uh, Public Records Office in Hong Kong, uh, some from the National Archives of Singapore, uh, coupled with uh, past newspaper reports, uh, personal memoirs, as well as uh, undiscovered personal papers collections to show how Hong Kong transformed itself from a city of broken freedoms to a city whose freedoms were globally praised, at least at a time when it was handed over back to China. The second feature is that it situates the illegal history of Hong Kong, not only as a city's local history, but as a part of the bigger history of global politics among world powers, and as a part of the changing Sino-British relations um, in terms of uh, diplomacy. So this is the table of content. Uh, it's divided into six chapters. The first four chapters basically talk about how Hong Kong, especially media and schools, were pervasively censored uh, uh, during the 130 years of colonial rule. And the last two chapters show a 180 degrees turnaround in attitude and how Hong Kong was liberated for China before its handover. So I'm going to show you some of the archival images and documents I used in these chapters to give you a snapshot of the 150 years of the histories of development and non-development of freedoms of Hong Kong in perhaps the next uh, 15 minutes. Suffice to say that for the first 100 years, undesirable criticisms against the governments or politically undesirable dissemination of ideas were tackled, controlled, by the government through two mechanisms. The first one is what I call punitive censorship. That means if you publish something naughty or politically undesirable, you would be pun punished primarily through the common law of seditious libels or criminal libels. So this gentleman, Murrow, uh, the chief editor of a mainstream English newspaper's Hong Kong Daily Press back in the, back in the 1850s, he published a report saying that a government's contract was awarded to a trading firm in which the governor's son was a partner. So he was sued, eventually uh, imprisoned for six months and fined $100 Hong Kong, which was a big money back then. Not only criticisms against uh, colonial governments uh, 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 was pursued, so this uh, colonial record shows that four Chinese newspapers, including two very mainstream ones, Wa Ji Yapo and Chun Wan Yapo. They were criminally prosecuted because of re reproducing a news report published in Guangzhou's newspapers, asking Chinese to race against the French in the 1880s. So five second thoughts. Why, you know, criticism against the French should be prosecuted, not against London, not against Hong Kong. Geopolitical context. So 1880, Sino-French War. So during that period of time, uh, Europeans partners, Europeans allies, they don't want the colonies to become a base of anti-imperialism. So therefore, any attacks against European allies uh, of Britain, especially because of the interest in China, will be pursued, criminal. So into the 20th centuries, I think the colonial government, especially London, uh, was very anxious about the rising sentiment of anti-imperialism and the rise of communist ideas and its disseminations, especially after the Indian mutiny uh, in Singapore, after the rise of uh, uh, Gada movement, which is independence movement in India, and especially after the rise of communism and the rumored cooperations between Guamindar and CCP in pursuing anti-imperialistic labor movement. So into the 20s after labor movements and strikes happened in Hong Kong, the colonial Hong Kong invented an unprecedented preemptive uh, uh, censorship mechanism in which uh, a regulation was passed which says that no person shall publish or distribute newspapers in Chinese language without its manuscripts first going through the government census under the Secretary of Chinese Affairs. This is an operating, note, uh, operating hours notice of the very much unknown in previous studies about the Hong Kong Press Census Office. It was kept by a veteran editor of uh, Mbaling, of Wakiriapo. 
It says that the press census office operated from Monday to Friday, 2 p.m. to 6 p.m., 8 p.m. to 1 a.m., Saturday, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., 9 a.m. to 11 p.m., uh, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m., and Sunday, 4 to 6, 8 to 1.30. So it works very much well with the production routine of newspapers because they collect the news and write the news in the morning and then send to print overnight. But before they were allowed to send to print, they have to send all the manuscripts of all the newspapers to press census office to be read by census line by line to see whether they are undesirable or political sensitive reports in which if they found, I mean the census found, undesirable words paragraph, they would be struck out. If you were the editors without Microsoft Word's help, how would you rearrange the layout if some of the words were struck out and deleted? So they have no choice but have to replace those blanks and words being deleted with crosses, dots, and boxes. So this is the newspapers eventually being sold in the street with cross crosses covering sensitive words disliked by the government uh, after political censorship. So five seconds guess. What does this cross mean or represent? So geopolitical context is in the 30s. So they represent Japan or Japanese because of the Anglo-Japanese um, kind of ambiguous um, uh, cooperations in which Britain basically stayed neutral in terms of Japanese aggressions in China. Hence, the British government or the colonial government did not want Hong Kong to be a base of anti-Japanese sentiment. Therefore, any attacks on Japan or Japanese aggressions in China would be censored. It's not a newspaper crosswords. So sometimes you basically myself included, could not guess what you know, they meant. You do see a lot of boxes covering not only individual words, sentences, but entire paragraphs. So after going through the censorship, more serious reports might face even serious censorship. So if the press census office found the entire report being unsuitable uh, uh, to be published politically, uh, just like, you know, what we have been earned now living by you know, journal submissions is a desk rejection. So the manuscript will be rejected uh, by the press census with a big cross and with a chalk in the middle. The chalk sets, the outer circle sets, Hong Kong press census office. The inner circle sets, this manuscript is banned from publications. And this, um, uh, Banned the manuscript from the cover image of my book. I, I, I was very lucky to be able to, to find two manuscripts in a personal paper collection, which has not been discovered and fully studied. So, you know, fast forward, <clears throat> uh, just now it was 30s into the 40s, World War II, Chinese Civil War, PLC was established. Suddenly, the nature of Hong Kong has changed. Hong Kong was no longer a hub for trading and shipping, uh, no longer only a hub for trading and shipping. It's also a hub for military intelligence and spies uh, because of, you know, a uh, uh, PRC set up next door. So therefore, with the explosions of populations and explosion uh, of the number of newspapers in Hong Kong, the colonial government was no longer able to only rely on or rely on the pre-censorship mechanism. So it had therefore devise a number of ordinance and regulations enabling the um, colonial government to nip so-called Chinese problem in the butt because uh, they believe that CCP has used Hong Kong uh, for dissemination of communist ideas to Southeast Asia. US is using Hong Kong as well to collect intelligence of the Chinese and Soviet communists. And Guomindang is using Hong Kong as well to exchange intelligence. So therefore, for the purpose of not extending the so-called civil war into Hong Kong. So for internal or state security purposes, Hong Kong colonial government devised a number of laws empowering the government to take quick actions without even the need to go through open court trial hearing. So they tightened deportation ordinance, they tightened detention rules so that uh, leftist um, uh, journal editors, uh, 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 leftist editors, journalists, 
teachers, principals, or some activists could be deported overnight uh, based on the discretion of the governor in council and could be detained without trial. Most of them detained in Chim Sa Choi. Why Chim Sa Choi? Because it's close to train station, so they could be deported right back to China if needed. The detention could be indefinite without trial. So hence, uh, a number of very famous uh, 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 leftist um, uh, uh, school principals and teachers, as well as um, newspapers editors were so detained and deported. Another, uh, uh, very few people know about this ordinance, Control of Publications Ordinance was passed in the 50s in which uh, newspaper press could be suppressed, suspended without going through open court trial if they were suspected of having published seditious headlines and reports. So this new newspaper headline showing uh, three uh, leftist newspapers being raided, suspended uh, by policemen. You can see policemen uniformed and holding shotgun uh, in front of the press offices uh, in the 60s. So of course, if um, uh, those uh, activists would like to be, uh, according to the wish of the colonial government, to be punished openly, uh, to have education purpose or chilling effects to other activists, they could be brought to open trial, prosecuted under sedition charges. Not only the press, actually schools also alerted um, colonial government a lot because a lot of uh, left-wing schools being established during the height of the Cold War period. Therefore, education ordinances were tightened, regulations tightened, where no instructions of partially or wholly political nature could be carried out in schools, no political activities, no political curriculum could be discussed, and uh, no flags, slogans of political nature could be displayed in school. Unlike today, flying the national flag or the national day could be a crime or could you know, result in uh, principals being deregistered, teachers being deregistered, or even students being expelled because the government uh, had the power to expel students from schools because of its participations in labor movement or political activity. Worst come to worst, schools could be closed by the governor or the Department of Education you know, for carrying out, despite repeated warnings, political activities. And uh, in the past, a number of famous left-wing uh, uh, schools had been so closed. So in the 60s, uh, not only the newspapers, I think uh, uh, new media, not handful of course, uh, not internet, uh, new media uh, such as radio broadcasting came to be um, uh, one of the major source of information, news, and entertainment for the people of Hong Kong. And I think very few people know that, despite the fact that RTHK has been established in the late 20s, actually radio broadcasters and some TV broadcasters in Hong Kong had no right to write their newscasts, had no right to collect the news, to write the news, and to broadcast its news scripts. What they had to do is to read the new scripts prepared by government information services all the way until early 70s. This is the government information services annual report showing that their staff prepare newscast bulletins for RTHK, commercial radio, Red Diffusions, and for a few years, HKTVB. So if you were old enough, you would not be surprised to see celebrities instead of journalists reading newscasts at HKTVB, such as and This is a correspondence from Hong Kong government approving the supplies of additional new streams to commercial radio because commercial radio would like to increase their newscast time over the midnight. That shows that it actually happened. So that's how the uh, Hong Kong government control strictly the news. Not only the news, even entertainment. This is a note of censor Samuel Chen sent to the uh, Secretary for Chinese Affairs, which has been subsequently forwarded to the um, uh, controller of broadcasting, which is Huang Bo Chijiang. 
reporting that he had listened to the gramophone records stored in the library of RTHK and censored them and reported, you know, if there's any undesirable political images or, or, or messages, uh, he could listen in those songs and gramophone records. And he reported a number of them being, you know, no problem. And a few of them having slight uh, political connotations, which could be as far as Mun Gong Hong, uh, okay, which talked about a Song Dynasty hero, which sounds patriotic. So the censors reported uh, to his board saying that that song you know, should not be included in LTHK's programs. That's how censors work on a day-to-day -day basis in Hong Kong. Everything changed when this gentleman arrived. Matt uh, he's fully remembered by his reform, but very few people know about the context or geopolitical context of his reform. Upon his arrival, he, re he reported to foreign office about his business plan. He, as a diplomat in training, situate Hong Kong's governance against Sino-British relations in 20 years time, where Britain would need to negotiate with China about the future of Hong Kong. And uh, he said that the urgent thing that we need to do is to wide the margin of standard of living between Hong Kong and mainland China, so as to foster the loyalty of Hong Kong people towards colonial government. For what? For maximizing or improving its bargaining positions, for negotiating with China for the future of Hong Kong. But the question is, why negotiate? If you were the tenant, the lease was up, then you just left. But that's not the case. Because in the 70s, according to this cabinet's report, Actually, Britain has three options in mind. The first two priorities would be, number one, status quo. Persuade China not to interfere with the continued administrations of the British government in Hong Kong beyond 1997. Second option, handed over the lease that they signed with the Qing government to Beijing for amendment to formally extend the lease. Failing these two options, they would orderly withdraw in 1997. So that's why all these plans and contacts and uh, 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 motivations was behind the very well remembered golden age of Magley Holes, who carry out those social reforms in housing, medicals, education, etc. And also, during his governorship, it was for the first time that the uh, Hong Kong government publicly promoted the importance of free press and called for participations of journalists in criticizing the government. And it was for the first time even that Hong Kong held the CPU, which is Commonwealth Press Union's annual conference in Hong Kong, inviting uh, members from the Commonwealth to discuss the importance of free press. Yet, my chapters of Matley Holes is called uh, Covert um, uh, Control and Overt Loosening. So despite all this loosening, actually the draconian laws that I mentioned before were not removed from the statute book. So many people, especially university students that they called new left were closely monitored and could be prosecuted by those law if needed. Although the fact is that it was less often used, less prosecutions, but it was um, used as well if needed. So just like this you know, naughty posters posted by the new left, uh, was prosecuted and action taken by the police. So, because of time, I, I'm not going to um, uh, 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 tell you why the subsequent events show in the PowerPoint happened, but I'm show, going to show you what happened. So hopefully you will find from the books the answers, why and how this happens. Failing the so-called negotiations, the joint declaration was signed, that call for orderly withdrawal of the uh, British you know, administrations in Hong Kong. And hence, many of these draconian laws that I mentioned, including control of publications ordinance, film censorships ordinance, education ordinance, were substantially revised, removed, or liberated. Uh, before, students were not allowed to discuss political issues in schools. If you remember in the 80s, we have a movement called Gong Man Gao Yong, civic education. Into the 80s, not only 
students were not banned from discuss politics uh, in classroom. They were encouraged to discuss politics in classroom from the 80s. So more geopolitical events or Chinese politics as well as British politics intercepted in this period that accelerated what I call the legal cleansing or liberation exercise. Uh, that also resulted in the structural separations of judiciary from the government for the first time in the history of Hong Kong. And the retirement of uh, the last English Chief Justice, Dennis Roberts, in Hong Kong, which many of you might not know that before he became Chief Justice, despite the rhetoric of judicial independence, he had been the Colonial Secretary and had been the Attorney General for the government before he became the chief justice. So Chinese politics came into play. I'm not, you know, I don't need to you know, further explain this incident. That further accelerated legal liberalization in Hong Kong. After that, Hong Kong got its Bill of Rights. Actually, the Bill of Rights draft had been uh, in the shelf of Hong Kong government in the 80s. But back then, they decided not to do it until the happening or after the happening of the Tiananmen. Also, British politics got into play that accelerated the legal liberalizations. Margaret Thatcher stepped down together with the stepping down of her Chinese advisors, which brought the change of governorship in Hong Kong by bringing in this gentleman, which needs no introductions. And hence, the legal liberalizations further accelerated, sometimes uh, without you know, concerning whether Beijing opposed or not. So police powers further curbed. Many laws being repealed or substantially uh, removed or revised you know, if they are at odds with the free speech, which has been entrenched for the first time in Hong Kong history as a constitutional right, according to the Bill of Rights Ordinance. TVs, radios, all these censorship powers being lifted. And this chapter ends. This is a farewell speech of Chris Patton. Uh, his narrative is that uh, the greatest contributions of British administrations in Hong Kong was leaving Hong Kong with the rule of law and a freer society. That's his narrative. My narrative would be the success lies in the fact that a colonial legacy was established by erasing the marks of colonialism. So his chapter ends my talk is going to end too. But before my talk is going to end, I'm going to share with you another uh, historic phenomenon, which is I've never seen an academic book in hardcover being sold so cheaply at 29 pounds, <laughs> especially <laughs> given, given the value of pounds today. So please get a copy if you're interested uh, with that. I'm happy to listen to uh, Joanna's comments and your question. Thanks so much. Uh Thank you, Michael, for, for a really interesting talk and for presenting it with all these diagrams and documents to enliven your presentation. Now, we'll turn to Professor Johannes Chen SC and his cross-examination. Right, thank you, uh, uh, Po Yun, for the introductions. Um, and let me first, uh, by congratulating Michael uh, for publishing this book um, and... I think it is a, a thought-provoking book uh, which offers a new perspective that is supported by extensive and meticulous research on hitherto unknown archival materials. The arguments are interesting and have been presented in the most persuasive manner. Uh, and indeed, I learned a lot from the book uh, as uh, um, um, similar to many other peoples, uh, we know that the colonial regime um, in law has been very impressive or, or very repressive. And Michael has demonstrated that it is not just on paper, but um, the repressive censorship measures were actually carried out uh, in a most pervasive manner. Now, the book raised two arguments. The first argument is reject the ideas of the benign government, as uh, Michael has uh, just demonstrated, a censorship law was pervasively used in the last 130 years out of the 150 years of colonial rule. 
uh, and it challenges the conventional belief that English rule of law is the most important legacy of British law uh, in Hong Kong. And he attributes the reasons to global geopolitics. And I think Michael books are unfold a fascinating story of censorship in Hong Kong, as you have just seen uh, and I heard from Michael, the line by line censorship in Chinese press, the establishment of a census, press census office, uh, and the, the, the censorship exists not only under emergency situation in the early 1920s, it continued well after uh, the emergency has died down uh, and under what he called an imagined state of danger. And continue after the colonial, after the war, uh, and expand into other areas like education and media and entertainment. Uh, and interestingly, he also put MacLeod's highly regarded social reform uh, in that geopolitical global context. Um, the conclusion he reached at page 187 uh, is this clear that what happened in mainland China in global geopolitics and in China relations with Britain, the US and the allies matter much more to the British and colonial governments than did the people of Hong Kong in determining the freedoms they enjoy. And I think um, I, I, I largely agree with um, the analysis, uh, but then there are a few questions that we can further discuss. One is, does geopolitics provide an adequate explanation? And secondly, what is the role of Hong Kong, particularly a changing Hong Kong in all this? Uh, and thirdly, whether geopolitical concerns necessarily exclude consideration of the rule of law or human rights? Now, when we refer to geopolitics, uh, it is a, a very vague and all-embracing terms and covers a wide range of political and economic concerns from anti-imperialism at the turn of the 20th century, uh, British le legitimacy, Cold War legacy, uh, strengthening British hands in negotiation of the future of Hong Kong, and finally the orderly and dignified withdrawal from Hong Kong. Now, all encompassing as these issues are, uh, would there be other issues that we need to explore further? The first questions um, I think uh, more work would be of interest uh, is the pre-war period, roughly from 1842 to 1938. And during this period, how was Hong Kong censorship regime different from the censorship measures adopted by the British colonial powers in other parts of the British Empire? Uh, India, Michael has just mentioned, Singapore, Malaysia, Kenya is pretty brutal, uh, South Africa, Ireland, Palestine. So was Hong Kong just part of the same colonial story? And how far the colonial government responses to the challenges of its legitimacy differ? I think that would be an interesting comparison. And then when we move to the post-war period, uh, it is basically the Cold War legacy. And Hong Kong became a battleground for ideology and patriotisms uh, between the Communist Party and the KMT. But in the wider context, it is basically the free world liberal democracy versus socialist communism, uh, the Iron Curtain, the Soviet bloc, and so on. Uh, and in the Asian region, indeed, Singapore has been playing a leading role in counterbalancing the expansion of communist China in Asia. Uh, and Lee Kong Yeo is known to be quite ruthless against communists as well. So how did Hong Kong square into that and compare with Singapore, which could be of interest? And thirdly is the book has said very little about the global climate of decolonization after the war, uh, presumably because uh, decolonization is not an option for Hong Kong. Uh, and so British strategy is very different. But nonetheless, it seems that there is a blank between 1945 to 1950 uh, in the book. And in particular, I have in mind uh, Governor Mark Plant, uh, Young Plant's the democratic reform in the 1946 after Governor Young's uh, return from internship during the Japanese occupation. He introduced the democratic reform uh, of a directly elected municipal council. Uh, and in his um, uh, introduction uh, speech to the LegCo, he said the inhabitants of the territory can be given a fuller and more responsible share in the management of their own affairs. And it is an appropriate and acceptable means of affording to all communities in Hong Kong 
an opportunity of more active participation through their responsible representatives in the administration of the territories. And the policy of His Majesty government that the constitution should be revised on a more liberal basis as soon as possible. So Mark Young's re reform was initially supported by the British government, uh, although it was interestingly opposed by some local politicians, uh, eventually sabotaged by his successors, uh, Governor Graham, and abandoned as a result of the Cold War. And this is, of course, a typical of British decolonization scheme, uh, but note the reference to the rights of the Hong Kong people to participate in the administration of that territory, albeit in a modest manner. So if you look at it from another angle, if you look at the geopolitics, as uh, we, I described early on, these are matters falling within the proper purview of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. But if you look at the situation from the viewpoint of the governors of Hong Kong, uh, they have a Hong Kong to govern. Uh, Britain was 8,000 miles away. China was 22 miles away only. Uh, governors face threat from China. They have to deal with directives from London. And more particularly, they face challenges from the local community. So they have to track carefully to balance these opposing forces. Whereas the Foreign and Commonwealth Office is more concerned of its foreign relations and if we look at legitimacy and security or public order, now these is a continuing theme throughout the colonial history in the British empires. And in most colonies, challenges of legitimacy comes from within and normally arises from nationalistic sentiment and oppression by the colonial government. Whereas in Hong Kong, the main sources of anxiety on legitimacy primarily came from China both from the Communist Party and the KMT, and only to be made worse by the ideological battles. So in a way, the China factor is just a cause for the fear of challenge to the colonial legitimacy. And in order to govern effectively, most governors uh, were more concerned with public disorder, which is less a concern for foreign office. Uh, and, and we can see, as a result, public order and securities are placed well above either rule of law or human rights. And in this regard, uh, there are constant conflicts between the FCO and the governors. Uh, and Michael's book indeed highlight a few where Granham's more uh, repressive measures were actually tuned down by the Foreign Office. And then back to the Magley Hose Grand Plan, and which is a, a very interesting uh, um, argument to put Magley Hose Grand Plan uh, or his um, well celebrated social reform in light of uh, the geopolitical concern. Uh, but is that grand plan a continuation of British foreign policy rather than a new vision of Magley Hose? Uh, and can it be complementary with better human rights protections, whether there is an alternative interpretation of his grand visions? And we talk about uh, overt liberalization and covert control, which is the title of the chapters in Michael's book. Uh, is the control really that covert? No, is this just something new or continuations? Uh, and in the, back in 1943, uh, the colonial office has already established a Hong Kong planning unit, uh, worrying that China may demand the return of Hong Kong after the Second World War. And in 1947, there was a joint paper uh, by FCO and the colonial office on the various options on Hong Kong. And the two officers could not agree with one another the paper was not submitted to the cabinet. Uh, and at the same time, China seems to be in no hurry uh, to um, take back Hong Kong. Uh, China positions um, after communist comes into party is to wait and see and negotiate when conditions are right. So in the UK cabinet paper 1949, which um, Michael has just referred to a bit, uh, and they found that after 1949, the UK government are not willing to start the negotiation for various reasons. And one of the reasons uh, is that we should equally refuse to discuss the future of Hong Kong with a government which is undemocratic, since we should not be prepared to hang the people of Hong Kong over to a communist uh, regime, uh, to hand Hong the people of Hong Kong up to hang. Uh, and these concerns, in a way, uh, they do not suggest that British economic interest is the only consideration. 
and to some extent, they echoes uh, Grant approach, uh, Governor Grant approach that promotion of British interest and promotion of the welfare of the local community are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Uh, his so-called constructive partnership between the government and the people. And in a way, Magliho's grand vision is just a continuation uh, of these policies well before him. Uh, and he must be familiar uh, with all these uh, uh, history. And at the same time, like all other governors, he faced increasing challenges uh, from the local community. Uh, and indeed, the censorship regime has no shortage of his critics, even in the early 1920s or 1930s. Uh, and various uh, cases were vigorously defended in court. Uh, the Chinese newspaper made a joint petitions uh, against the censorship re regime, against Chinese censorship. And Sir Men Kam Lo uh, succeed in putting forward a motion debate uh, before the LACHCO against the use of the emergency regulations uh, power to continue the censorship against the Chinese press and even the English press, South China Morning Post, etc. also join in the petition against this regime. Uh, and the speech of uh, Sir Man Kiam Lo at LACHCO in 1936 uh, is uh, so good that I think um, um, I can't resist citing it here. Uh, and he said, if the Chinese press is to have only a measure of the freedom of the press, while that definition of public danger exists, and that public danger, of course, uh, is a term uh, in the emergency regulations ordinance, which still exists today. And he continued, then I feel that I, for one, will not live to see the day that it is free. If you are going to give freedom to the Chinese press only at a time when there is an idealistic state, blissful inertia and benevolent governments without armaments, then I say to you, sir, don't give it because there will be nobody in this world to enjoy it. And how true it is today as it was in 1936. And back to the time of Magli Holes, uh, when he came to Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong has just come out of the 1967 riots. China was still at the height of cultural revolutions and in pretty chaotic situation. There were a large number of refugees from China who are now stuck in Hong Kong, creating pressing social and housing problems. A new generation of Hong Kong people now rose to the front stage, together with a shift of focus of communist propaganda on domestic affairs, as directed by Zhou Enlai. So would Magliho's paper be an attempt to buy in the FCO to justify his ambitious social reform program, to divert the legitimacy issue uh, and focus on livelihood and divert conflict? Uh, as continuations uh, of Graham's constructive partnership policy. And it seems that the Hong Kong domestic factor seems to have been underplayed. And Matt Lee Ho's, uh, no doubt on the one hand, he has this grand vision in mind, but there may be other factors at work and we know in politics, there are always multiple uh, motivations. And he's trying also to create a space for the people of Hong Kong, both physically and metaphysically. And nonetheless, the control may not be as overt, uh, as, as covert as it suggests. Public order has been a constant source of social conflicts throughout the 1970s, uh, from the Chinese language movement to Goba, ICAC, Delhi Thai Island, uh, petition of the boat people, uh, and when the boat people uh, petitioned the governments for uh, early rehousing because their boat at the Thai Yamati Typhoon shelter was sinking, uh, and when they reached the Cross Harbor Tunnel, uh, the boat people, together with the organizers, were charged, uh, were arrested, and subsequently 13 of them were charged with uh, an authorized assembly and the public order ordinance. Uh, the Precious Blood, uh, uh, Precious Blood Golden Jubilee Secondary School initially a dispute about uh, financial mismanagement and irregularities in church-run school. Uh, eventually uh, it escalates and the government uh, has no hesitation to close down the school. Uh, so these are not covert at all. 
Uh, but then at the same time, if you look at UK, uh, UK has also uh, a rigorous uh, liberal development of the common law at that period of time. Uh, and indeed, when we look at the common law values, uh, some of the leading cases uh, may not have appeared as long as they seem to be. Uh, the presumption of innocence was what we call the golden thread uh, of criminal law. It was decided in DPP and Wilmington in only in 1934. And Richard and Bowen, the leading case on um, the uh, rules of natural justice, was decided only in 1964. Uh, the general duty to act fairly was in re HK in 1967, uh, and nullifying any attempt to oust the jurisdiction of the court in the celebrate and misnick case was in 1969, uh, and Ng Yun Siu on legitimate expectation came uh, in 1981 and then the well-known case of CCSU on judicial review in 1985. So in the 1960s, early 70s, this is also the golden period of liberal development in the common law, and they find their way into Hong Kong common law as well. And which leads to another factor is that Hong Kong is not a static city, and Hong Kong has changed a lot. Uh, it's no longer just a commercial city laying golden eggs for China, but an international financial center with now a surge of awareness of civil and political rights. Uh, and as Chris Patton recently in his uh, uh, latest book, The Hong Kong Diary, said, uh, the problem today is that Jeffrey Howe feels that his baby, the Joint Declaration, will grow up into a difficult teenager that he did not know and did not want to deal with. And one of the uh, um, um, arguments, uh, which um, a small point where um, Michael tried to illustrate Mackley Ho's uh, overt uh, um, uh, uh, control uh, is the silencing of the ICCPR. When ICCPR was uh, ratified, uh, it was not given any publicity. Um, that may be a bit harsh, as I think that bureaucratic blunder may be a better explanation than part of the grand plan. Uh, in 1976, reporting, periodic reporting is not as well known uh, in UK or in Hong Kong. And indeed, until 1990 uh, or late 1990, when the Human Rights Act was passed in UK, if you ask an ordinary average UK citizen, they will know about the European Convention. But probably very few people knows about the ICCPR, uh, and UK has not consulted its own people on her own report to the ICCPR. Uh, and Whereas when we move into the 80s in his period uh, and his period of uh, rapid liberalizations, uh, we have seen that the second report, uh, which was heard in 1988, uh, the second report was not known either, notwithstanding the general climate of liberalization. Uh, and indeed, uh, the people of Hong Kong learned about the second report uh, when um, uh, a senior officials of Amnesty International visit Hong Kong uh, and discuss with Hong Kong people during lunch. Then Hong Kong people find out that there is a second report. And that was as late as in 1988. Uh, and whereas there was some hesitation about introduction of the Bill of Rights, uh, which was rightly said to have been triggered by um, the, the um, June, um, June 4th event in China, uh, but indeed well before that, uh, the Attorney General, Michael Thomas, has already initiated a study uh, on how to entrench the ICCPR in domestic law in 1986 to 87. Uh, so some of these may not fit into nicely, uh, and we know that uh, from the 60s, 70s onward, with these more unprecedented liberations, uh, they carry with a price. Uh, it would result in greater demand for democracy, championing, uh, campaigning for greater rights, challenging the legitimacy of the colonial government, fostering a local identity. And Michael in his book asks an interesting question. Uh, would the unprecedented liberation that Hong Kong experienced in the years prior to the handover have occurred if British administration had continued beyond 1997? I mean, that's an interesting question. Uh, and I try to put another question or put the questions in a slightly different way. Uh, and namely, with this unprecedented liberation and retention of covert control, how could the, or how would the colonial government intend to govern if British administration were to continue beyond 1997, as Mackley Host had hoped. 
And it is absolutely right. I agree entirely with Michael that the awakening period uh, comes only in the last, probably I would be more generous to say the last 20 years uh, rather than last 10 years. Uh, they are all too little too late. Uh, we have transplanted the common law system, but without sufficiently transplanting the values underlying it. Uh, the legal system is basically alienated from the ordinary people. Uh, the law was in English only until 1988. And most of the censorship um, measures were legitimized by statutes. And there's no democratic legislature to scrutinize uh, these censorship measures. Uh, indirect elections was introduced, as we know, only uh, in a form of functional constituency in 1995. And under that background, I think um, the part that I would like to see more uh, is the link uh, of this geopolitics with um, judicial independence or the rule of law, uh, because there's very little evidence about tampering with judicial independence. Uh, the main evidence of a close link between civil service and judiciary lies with the appointment of Sir Dennis Roberts. Uh, but beyond that, in the same period, uh, both before and during Sir Dennis uh, was the Chief Justice, we have seen increasing judicial criticism. And one of the cases that I mentioned, the boat people case, uh, when they went to the Court of Appeal, the Court of Appeal was pretty harsh with the government uh, and heavily criticized the then uh, unlaw the law of unlawful assembly under the public order ordinance uh, and partly due to the criticism from the Court of Appeal, it led to a um, uh, liberalized reform of the public order ordinance in the early 1980s. Um, so how much uh, and what exactly is the role of the judiciary in the local legal profession? I think that is a question that worths to be further explored. Do they just go along with censorship regime? And if so, why? Or was it just a continuation uh, of the same mentality that stability and security are above everything. Um, that takes me to the last point, uh, and Michael rightly pointed out at the last part of his book, in the concluding part, that this book is not to be read as a general denial of the common law's contribution to Hong Kong, and I entirely agreed. Uh, but then at the very end, uh, there is a probably control, uh, potentially controversial paragraph uh, where he writes the protesters who recently waved the colonial flag in demonstrations against the post-colonial Hong Kong government, they may hold a fanciful nostalgic imagination of the freedoms enjoyed under the colonial legal regime and would be surprised by the electricity with which the current government has moved to embrace that supposedly liberal regime. They may wish to ask themselves whether that constitutes a step forward or backward for the people of Hong Kong. Uh, an interesting thought there, uh, but this passage may well lead the readers into the trap of comparison, uh, which may not be the intention of Michael's in writing this book. And when we are going to compare with which period of Hong Kong should we compare the pre-war colonial period, the post-war period under the uh, uh, umbrella of Cold War all the last 30 years. And if we turn around the table again and ask a different questions, in resurrecting all the draconian colonial law, in suppressing opposition voices, and arguably going even far beyond what the colonial government has done, whether the supposedly ending of the colonial era and returning to China's sovereignty is, in terms of political censorship and freedom of expression, a step forward or backward. If we take a different view about the flags, I think the nostalgic waving of the colonial flag is not a romanticization, uh, romanticization of the colonial rule or an endorsement of the colonial history, but a mourning for the loss of common law values that were never properly transplanted to the colony, that were not given an opportunity to take root here after our first taste of it, and that were forgotten or abandoned long before they have a chance to flourish. But what's wrong in the colonial era is certainly not a justification for repeating the same wrong in the post-colonial era of the Hong Kong SAR. The value of historical study is to learn from our mistakes. Uh, and Michael's book shows uh, how bad the previous uh, colonial history is. Uh, and hopefully we can learn from our mistakes. But sadly, history tends to repeat itself.
So all in all, I think this is an excellent book which I would strongly recommend. It provides a lot of uh, stuff for us to reflect upon the colonial era. So it remains for me to congratulate Michael again and thank you. Uh, thank you, Johannes, for that very <laughs> well-prepared and detailed commentary and discussion. Naturally, I would give Michael some time to...